People from all over the world want to do something in response to climate change, but they need leadership. The Asian Development Bank completed a study that supports the citizens and governments of the region. And now the time has come to sit at the table and plan the way forward. When the chips are down, the stakes are high. Ladies and gentlemen, there is much to do. Shall we begin? The ADB study confirms that Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam are some of the most vulnerable parts of the world to be consequences of climate change. 80% of the people in much of the economic activity are within 100 kilometers of the coast, where rising sea levels could be as catastrophically high as 70 centimeters by 2100. As one of the world's most dynamic growth areas, the region's rapidly rising population will continue to seek work in agriculture, fishing and forestry, all of which are considered under threat. Climate change could force the relocation of millions of people and the risk of death from related disease and malnutrition in some parts will continue to the highest in the world. The economic costs of such terrible impacts indicate that Southeast Asia will suffer more than twice the global average, losing as much as 6.7% of combined domestic growth product by 2100. However, if actions are taken now, with the countries collaborating on a clear strategy, such devastation could be largely averted. This threat is not from natural causes, but has been created by us, the citizens of the world. And now we need leadership to deliver a solution that works for Southeast Asia. So the question is, where do we start and who takes the first steps? Well, it's down to the politicians and scientists, isn't it? They can't do it alone. It's all of us. Business entrepreneurs, volunteers and citizens all need to understand the situation and work together. Well, my business is battling with recession, so I already have enough to deal with. Using green economic development strategies, you might find the two challenges can be related. It's all about educating people to change but their way. But that would take decades. Surely, climate change is already happening. It's too late now. It's true that some of the impacts are now unavoidable. But presumably we can do things to lessen the impact and adapt to a situation we know is coming. Yes, adaptation is important. However, there's another way of throwing the dice on this. Mitigation. Yes. But we also have to completely change the way we live now if we are to prevent even worse impacts in years to come. And who's going to make that happen? All of us. But it needs to be driven by public policy and government interventions. I think policymakers have to think out of the box. Because if you continue with business as usual, then I think we are in trouble. The world is in trouble. Change, especially long-term systemic change, is only possible if you create the platform on which change can happen. Policy is that platform. Climate change is a phenomenon that is not solved by the market. The industries are polluting but not incorporating the environmental cost. Therefore, you need the government to correct the market mechanism through taxation, through subsidies, through whatever. You know, ultimately it comes down to pricing so that uh, you can either do it by removing subsidies or by putting on uh, additional taxes to shape consumer and business behavior or by uh, adjusting import uh, rules on you know, environmentally sound technologies. Those kinds of shifts are all within the policy toolbox of governments and you can see examples of those playing out around Asia. One of the problems I have with looking at very narrow financial or economic uh, analysis of the problem is that you lose sight of the human dimensions of it. The impacts of climate change are going to translate into several human impacts that we need to be concerned about. Two-thirds of Indonesia is sea. So when we have the climate change, the sea level will go up. Even now, we, are, we have lost 29 islands. So when the sea level go up further, you can imagine that our experts told me that we will lose 2,500 islands. So for Indonesia, climate change is not a theory, not something that you should debate, discuss. It's a survival of the country. 
so that means you know this is a global scandal. So it's happening, but everybody you know, they not realize that's the you know this the effect, you know himself or themselves. They think that's this happening somewhere, not here. So this is you know, the, the the big problem. So it affects the country itself, losing islands. It influences rice production. It hits the coastal area. It creates new diseases. And we are a developing economy with an income of less than $2,500 per capita income, with 230 million people. So the cost and the impact of climate change is significant. We, we start to talk with the policymakers. Look, if you don't do anything, at the end of this century, you're going to lose 6.7% of your GDP, which is enormous. So, in reversely, if you take some action right now, which is less than 1% of your GDP, then you can avoid these damages. So, what's your choice? You're going to take action now, or you're going to just leave it and doing something, and then later, your next generations will bear this cost. Let's begin with a global picture. Southeast Asia plays a crucial part in the planet's ecosystem. We are one of the most highly vulnerable global regions, and at the same time, we are responsible for about 12% of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions, so we are critical to the future global plan. The largest contributor to the region's emissions is the forestry sector, which holds the key to successful reductions. At the same time, the energy sector is the fastest growing contributor, but has vast untapped opportunities for efficiency improvements that could be achieved at little or even no cost. These kinds of options have the potential to mitigate up to 40% of the region's emissions by 2020. Another 40% could be achieved through fuel switching from coal, the cost of less than 1% of regional GDP. So the question is, how can we incentivize everyone to play their part? As you say, it's a global issue. But it's not easy to persuade people there can make a difference. If everyone in the region knew that we have the world's highest technical mitigation potential in agriculture and forestry, it might empower them. If they knew that the savings we make through mitigation will exceed the costs, it might change their minds. Our population is growing faster than most and will demand more. We can achieve the positive goals by making low carbon policies the norm and sustainable development planning a natural process. I like to compare climate change to Pandora's box. She opened this box and all these demons flew out and bedeviled the world to this day. If we are to address climate change effectively, first of all, we've got to shut the box. Then we have to deal with the demons. Shutting the box is what they call mitigation. Dealing with the demons is adaptation. If I cut off the tree and I can easily make the money and I can leave it with that tree, the timbers and so on. But what I'm saying for the climate change was something that's a really longer term issue. So that it's a really a dilemma of choosing short term choice or long term choice. But anyway, the most important uh, CO2 mitigation potential is the forest and also in the agriculture sector. I think for agriculture, uh, there is a lot of pot potential mitigation in, uh, for example, in rice. Uh, Asia is uh, you know, a continent with a lot of rice farmers. And methane reduction is a definite possibility. We can, uh, we can uh, promote practices that reduce methane emissions from paddy fields, and there are technologies uh, available for that. On the climate change mitigation side, it's more having to do with redirecting investment into areas that are going to lay the groundwork for the kinds of jobs that will be sustainable and will contribute to uh, prosperity, but at the same time position the economies to be competitive and productive and well-placed for the future uh, continued growth. The policymakers are always interested in looking at the current problem because uh, uh, the, they stay in the government only five years. So they really want to think how they can uh, really address the current needs of the people. 
and rather than thinking in a more long-term perspective, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and many studies on climate change are always talking about what will happen in 25 years, what will happen in 50 years. It's very hard for the policy maker to understand that. Policy change is also important in building our capacity to adapt. To manage the impact of climate change, we need to adjust our natural and human systems to reduce harm, and also to exploit beneficial opportunities. These actions must be taken by individuals, households, communities, businesses and governments. Our ability to adapt is threatened because of low incomes and poor access to infrastructure, services and education. There are gaps in social and economic development in the region, gaps in governments and public finance, gaps in availability of education, health and social support, gaps in the region's ability to diversify economically at the local level. There are wide variations in the region and a significant gap with the rest of the developed world. We need to close these gaps by keeping growth strong and making development sustainable and inclusive. So the question is, what are the adaptation priorities for our region? The problem with adaptation is that it suffers all the time from market failure. With the best intention, we can lower that risk. These failures arise because of uncertainty. If people had more information about long-term investment plans, if they knew about the positive added value of research and other activities, then with a good collaborative framework, governments could increase the region's adaptive capacity very quickly. But we don't have the money. We need to do more research. But studies show that the, the cost of building our capacity by 2100 would cost about 0.2% of regional GDP. But the benefits could reach 1.9% of GDP, by far outweighing the original investment. <laughs> Adaptation is going to be absolutely essential. The climate will change because what we've already done in the past and what we will be doing in the future. And it will be developing countries themselves that are hit earliest and hardest. It will be developing countries themselves which have to shape their own adaptation plans and their adaptation strategies. But they have every right to look to the rich world because most of the emissions that have taken place in the past have been in the, rich, in the rich world. The concentrations that we see in the atmosphere now, uh, the big majority of them come from the rich world. If you look at the, the need for climate ad adaptation to the impacts from climate change, that's sort of integral to development. It's talking about doing development in a new way that takes account of these impacts and tries to help uh, build resilience into the development process. We made a decision a few years back to convert our old oil-fired plant to state-of-the-art combined cycle gas turbine technology. That reduced our carbon emissions by two and a half million tons per annum, which is roughly equivalent to taking all of the cars in Singapore off the road. We have a very clear strategy because uh, not only do we have an environmental division within our group, uh, to consolidate all these environmental issues and activities but we also have board members working together and having a constant dialogue on this um, and I think that's really important really because it filters down to to management and also you know people who are actually working on the ground. The energy intensive industries are really uh, facing this um, and are having trouble frankly coping with with how they're going to uh, adjust to the to the new costs but at the same time, governments are trying to lay the groundwork for ways of softening that burden for them. That's happening in the Western countries, but it's also under, under great debate here in Asia. Actually, the, in the old era, we know that the farmers have their own uh, way uh, to cope with the climate variability. They have their own system, uh, and then have their own production system using the natural phenomena and natural indicators to know whether the season will, will come or not. But now, because of the environmental degradation, and then this kind of indicators cannot be used anymore in effect, in effective way. And this way, we need to, com to combine with the, within the indigenous knowledge with the contemporary knowledge. So I think, uh, you know, the first thing we have to do is enhance the uh, public awareness, including the policymakers' understanding, 
and then try to find the simple, easy, uh, and cheaper options which can be easily linked to their top priority uh, agendas. It's not just about funding. Learning from others can speed up the process. The demands on technology vary across the region. However, significant change could be brought about by neighboring countries sharing information and cooperating on joint initiatives. A good example is promoting energy trading with the different peak times across the region to lower the need for new generators in each country. Regional collaboration also promotes better policies and practices as the information and technology shared can be of more value to more people. Although the funding levels in the region are low compared to the task, they can be used to catalyze new co-finance. Dissemination of information about funding opportunities is critical and the region's presence in the international markets needs to grow. So the question is, how do we raise more investment and increase technology collaboration? Well, firstly, I think uh, people in a boardroom must understand that the world is going to move to a low-carbon future. If it doesn't happen today, it will happen tomorrow. I mean, this is the way the world is going to move. And therefore, those who are going to be ahead of the curve, who are going to position themselves and therefore uh, should be willing to take risks, are the ones that are going to come out as winners. Those who lag behind are the ones that are going to lose market share. We've come across businesses um, which have been engaged in carbon, despite this not being their core business since before 2000. They've taken a huge risk and they've been very forward-looking in engaging in the carbon markets at the time that they did. Um, and those are, unfortunately, the, the few and far between. Those are, those are the rare examples. Um, we also see a lot of companies um, with fantastic potential within, across their business assets, fantastic potential to develop carbon credit projects, but they have been a little bit reticent. They've said, we are a big business, carbon is not our core focus, why should we look at this? But I think that that mindset is gradually changing. The more that they see carbon is working for perhaps the smaller players who are able to take risk, the more incentivized they will be to, to feel that perhaps I'm missing out on something here. In an ideal world, you would always have the, the policy lead in the action. But uh, as I said to you, we have had to make investment decisions, clearly whilst policy will be in a state of change. I think uh, regional collaboration is so vital because, uh, for one thing, climate change is a global phenomenon. It will not just affect one country. And uh, in fact, the climate models are global in nature. We're trying to downscale it at the regional level. The solution is to focus on areas we agree on rather than to be hampered by areas where we have disagreements. But of course, the collaboration is not only between the government, but also with the private sector. How they can uh, allocate more uh, funding from, from, as part of their corporate, corporate social responsibility uh, to put on activities which is related to adaptation and mitigation. And some of the programs not really uh, prepared in an effective way, so sometimes the use of the money is not very efficient as well. You have on the one hand developing countries saying, you know, we want access to new clean technology, and the developed countries are saying, it's right there in the marketplace. Uh, so I think the two need to come together and really focus on what are the barriers and, and th whether it's through public-private partnerships or other mechanisms to uh, free up uh, legal constraints, move forward and, and get the technology into the hands of the developing countries so that they can move ahead with this transition. Inside government, collaboration is challenging. For many years, governments have found it difficult to enable their internal policy departments to work in a coordinated way. In the climate change scenario, this is unhelpful, as the challenge connects everything and has to be dealt with holistically. A government's environment ministry decides to put a tax on business energy consumption. 
The economics ministry welcomes the idea, but the trade department is unhappy, of course. The public entered a debate mostly positive about the change. However, with a concern about unemployment as a result, the government needs to coordinate the whole proposal. They decide to keep the tax change, but offer financial incentives to businesses that do well. Thus, a win-win situation where energy consumption is lowered, but only the uncommitted businesses suffer economically. Fair story? The question is, how can internal government coordination practice change? The governments in this region are trying to collaborate more efficiently. Yes, but the scale of internal change is not always understood. There's no chance of that type of collaboration within central government, surely. It's critical. Some are considering the idea of a powerful cross-cutting government agency that will be responsible for developing and then implementing a strategy across the board. In all policies, um, one of the biggest issues that affect the, the manner in which climate change will be addressed is in how governments uh, address the alignment of the three E's in policy making terms. That's economic policy, energy policy and also environment policy. Uh, because very often they have competing or contradictory objectives. Climate change is not owned only by environment minister, but also by the Department of Industry, of Forestry, of Agriculture, of Land Use. So climate change is an example that can be used as an integrating factor in which the government then mobilize or get all the departments on one table. I think leadership, you know, in in any sort of organization helps. And in the policy making arena said, you know, even more so it's crucial. And in Malaysia, we've seen, um, you know, a great change really because we've, you know, we've had a change in leadership, and that has actually helped significantly as well. More than just coral reefs, we, we could lose airports, we could lose seaports, we could lose highways, and therefore, the solutions must be to develop not only lifeboats, where human life can continue to thrive, but lifelines, the connections between those lifeboats, because. Without lifelines, you have no economies. And without any economies, then we face a real disaster. Yes, there are some gaps in the knowledge. But research at a regional level could rectify this. In the last few years, there has been a dramatic increase in the amount of regional and country-specific studies but there remain huge gaps in our understanding about what the impacts are likely to be regionally, and more research is needed to develop solutions. Some of these are technical, but others are social and behavioral and go beyond natural systems. Understanding more about migration patterns, livelihoods of very small farming and fishery businesses, disease prevention education, governance of adaptation, they are the non-technical side of research that are just as important. There is a need to create new research frameworks to share the work and ensure that the knowledge is passed on. And there is a, a saying that if you laid all of the economists end to end, they'd never reach a conclusion. And I think some people have said you could say the same about climatologists. But actually, with regard to global warming now, most of the climatologists have reached consensus. The, the key is uh, identifying areas where Perhaps uh, financing, uh, access to capital can make a difference on the margin, and perhaps uh, using our convening power to bring these different groups together. Well, I think uh, one of the things is we need more dialogues between uh, policymakers and researchers. Right now, there is the research community more or less working on their own, and there's the policy community, uh, and uh, as if at times there are silos between the two communities. I try to find a common language between the scientific community and the policymaker community together. And of course, it's very important that we, we find mutual you know, language with the both community. Then we understand together and we work together. So the young generation, the young politician should really emphasize the development of science, technology, logic, mathematics, physics, and so on, and use that to change the way of development, not exploiting, but enrichment of the natural resource. 
There's a lot to do. And very little time. A world in recession. Government short-term fire fighting. Investment falling. Just years of crisis management. Hold on there. And many people see this differently. Our leading expert and policy makers passionately believe this as a real opportunity. I think the time has come when we have to come up with new metrics on what represents success and development. And here may I quote Mahatma Gandhi. He said rightly, speed is, is irrelevant if you're moving in the wrong direction. You know, it doesn't make sense <laughs> for people to produce the same goods, the same services, if they're going to pile up. And if in the future, the public is not going to buy them. I think that this is really win-win solution for developing country to restructure their economy to toward the low carbon economy. So I think uh, you know, this is really a crisis, but for them, for the developing country especially, really great opportunity. I think maybe one or two years ago, the Thai government really took a step up and they said, we are going to set up a public-private partnership called TGO, Thai Greenhouse Gas Office. And TGO has done an amazing job in terms of uh, really streamlining the host country approval process. A lot of people look at the CDM process as, you know, step one, step two, all the way to UN registration. But there's so much support that the local government can give in terms of um, guiding the project owners, in terms of identifying for them where the opportunities are. So roles that you would expect maybe the private sector to take um, in Thailand, they are actually proactively doing it. They are remarkable things that global movements that are happening already and I think this is also influencing you know policy makers in a way because they know that you know the public is there and you know to support these initiatives and I think you know it creates that sort of you know that pressure for them to actually sort of deliver. It's going to be an exciting time. The question we have to ask ourselves are we going to resist change or are we going to embrace it? So my feeling is that you'll see a snowballing of actions. And therefore, if we look at the next five years, I think the end of the road is not Copenhagen. It's really the beginning of a journey. And I'm sure four years or five years beyond that, you'll see the world willing to take much greater action. To the young, to the politician, and to the young generation, look forward. I mean, it's a better world. It could be a better world because the science and technology is so improving and that it is feasible, it is in our reach to have a better life with using rationality, brain power, science, technology, but also belief in God. It's inspiring. Certainly challenging. But what a huge achievement if we make it work. Exactly. We have the ability to make this a moment in our history when change brings long-lasting benefit to people everywhere. It's an opportunity for us to demonstrate leadership in using low-carbon technologies to support high growth. As they say in the movies, the chips are down and stakes are high. To do nothing is a gamble we cannot take. <laughs>